about this incredible masterpiece. I hold now in my hands National Heroines Puerto Rican Women History for God, 1930s, 1950s, by of course, Olga Jimenez de Wagner, who I think we should give a round of applause. I promise I'll be brief. I'll try to be brief, right? Remember, I'm a professor, so I like to talk a lot, right? Um, <laughs> so these are some notes. For the informed reader, National Heroines provides a broad spectrum of inf information ranging from details from the Spanish colonial rule of the 19th century against the backdrop of the wars of independence in Latin America to the U.S. invasion of 1898, from the rise of nationalism in Puerto Rico in the early 20th century, along with the dark pages of history, Massacre de Ponce, uh, El Ataque de la Fortaleza, La Casa Blair, uh, Congress, and of course, torture and incarceration, to intimate particularities of the nationalist heroines' lives, and really, the birth of what we now call the era. Commonwealth. These are all exceptional. I don't know if the microphone is going to betray me, but all right. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. These are all exceptional, important topics of discussion, especially in light of our current situation in Puerto Rico and the diaspora. <clears throat> As the Commonwealth, in many ways, after almost 64 years of existence, is finally coming undone. The reader will find that the book is written in a language that is both accessible and entertaining to the lay person, and yet rigorous and sophisticated to the specialists in the field. In other words, in this book, Olga Jimenez de Wagenheim manages to write a text the way most of us in academic life would like to, but always fall short. Despite being a bona fide history book, National Heroines reads more like a companion of biographies or agiografias, you know, lives of saints some of us read as children. Or it reads as a novel of intrigue and espionage, or a story of unrequited love, un bolero de Daniel Santos, <laughs> or an indictment against the unfair legal proceedings and horrid conditions of incarceration for women both in the island and stateside. Or perhaps as a manifest underscoring the importance of the role of women in our history. A role that, needless to say, has not had its proper place in history until now with the publication of this book. Regardless of which version the reader feels closest to, I like the bolero part. <laughs> National Heroines is a book of great magnitude. One that will make us question what we think we know or understand about our history. Now, for me personally, this book is a lesson in humility. Let me explain. I, I brought some props. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this guy. It's an old shirt, so I'm sorry about the stains. And can you see the pin? It's a pin with the nationalist uh, symbol. Sorry. <laughs> 
Now, like I said, some of you might recognize uh, the pin. And this is a pin that I got back in 19, 1991, uh, a celebration. I was still in college back then. I was young and full of life. Um, and I got this, and I was so excited because I was such an admirer of Don Pedro, and, and I felt so close to the nationalist cause. So I thought, this is the way to go. Now, in 1996, I don't know if some of you recall, there was, you know, discussions in Puerto Rico about yet another referendum about the status. Uh, but this time, uh, Congressman uh, Don Young and uh, what's the other guy, Miller, was it Miller? I have it in my notes. Um, so anyway, these two congressmen wanted to go to the island and hold public hearings, you know, and so. People came and deposed and whatnot. Uh, Lolita Lebron actually went to uh, one of these public hearings. And um, after going through a whole long list of petitions, she was rudely interrupted by Miller. And this is, this is why we have here the shirt. En mi nación, nadie me calla. so much that I have to like hide it and not wear it anymore because you know I'm not gonna have a t-shirt to leave my kids anymore. <laughs> now to say that I'm a long time admirer of Lolita Lebron is an understatement. My daughter's name is Lola. My son Matias was named after Matias Brookman, the revolutionary leader of Capa Prieto, Capa Prieta. Uh, this is in the 19th century in my MS. So I tell you all of this because as a believer in our independence, I thought I knew a thing or two about the nationalist movement in Puerto Rico. But of course, Olga proved me wrong. <laughs> National heroines, in that sense, for me, it's, it's in that sense for me a tour de force. And as such, it should be read immediately. It contains the stories of 16 Puerto Rican women who participated in the grand revolutionary events of modern Puerto Rico and who were detained, humiliated, some unfairly incarcerated, and tortured by the US government and at the hands of the colonial administration of Luis Muñoz Marin. The book opens with the story of Dominga de la Cruz Becerril. De La Cruz, a black woman of humble origins, attended and witnessed the infamous Ponce Massacre of 1937, where 21 people lost their lives and at least 150 were tortured. Her crime, as Jimenez explains, was taking the Puerto Rican flag from a wounded comrade before he fell on the ground. This act would cause Dominga a life of persecution, and thus she lived in exile in Mexico and Cuba, mainly in Cuba, for the rest of her days. In my view, bringing Dominga's story to light is one of the biggest contributions of this book. You know, I have not even heard of Dominga, which is shameful on my part, but it's, this is the way of this book. Dominga was celebrated in Cuba. Uh, much here and there. In Puerto Rico, nothing. A few pages. So, this book, if it ended there, huge contribution. But of course it doesn't. From there, we move to part two, containing the stories of seven women who were imprisoned in Puerto Rico between 1950 and 1954. This is without a doubt my favorite part of the book. Perhaps it's because it's the, only part, it's, it's the only part of the book where the reader gets treated to witness Jimenez's ability as an oral historian. There are two interviews here. And you see the magic of someone like Roy guys that you don't even know she's there. You know? uh, that is a treat for us. Or maybe it's my favorite part because of the powers of the stories. 
We meet Blanca Canales, the sister of the great journalist Nemesio Canales, who proclaimed the Republic of Puerto Rico from Ayurin 1950. We also get acquainted with Leonides Diaz Diaz, the model mother and wife. Carmin Perez, the youngest of the group, and for sure the feistas. Ruth Mary Reynolds, La Gringa Pacifica. Doña Isabel Rosado, a legend amongst us, seen fighting in Vieques in her late 80s. In fact, I don't know if you remember, and it's in the book, there's an incredible picture of uh, Doña Isabel being uh, submitted, subdued by uh, an officer in Vieques. And this person is huge, and of course she's like in her 80s there. Uh, this was the power of, uh, of Doña Isabel. And I, this is one of my favorite chapters of the book. The tragic Doris Torresola, shot by the police while protecting Don Pedro and in grief after losing her brother Griselio and later, later on her mother. And finally, the fan fatal Olga Vizcali. Even if history had not touched them, all of these women were incredible in their own right. They all chose to follow the call of freedom and they all exhibited a quasi-religious quasi adoration for La Patria and their leader, Don Pedro Eliso Campos. And this is something that repeats, is repeated in the book. Don Pedro is kind of a quasi-religious figure, you know? And in fact, one of them refers to him as a messianic uh, figure. In part three, nationalist women in prison in the U.S., we meet Rosa Cortez and Lola Otero. The, the wives of Oscar Collazo and Griselio Torresola, respectively. I don't know if you remember Griselio, but he lost his life back in 1950 when they attacked the Blair House. Um, Oscar Collazo survived, but uh, you know, he uh, spent a lot of time in jail. And Rosa and Lola were basically these martyrs, uh, in a way, waiting for the husbands to come and celebrating the legacy uh, of them. We also learn more about Lolita de Bruno, her lost loves, her grief after the death, death of her son, and the betrayal of her brother Gonzalo. This is indeed the main course of the book. Uh, I must confess, I, this whole story about Gonzalo, I did not know any of it. You know, I've been an admirer of this one for years. And that part of the history had not clicked. Um, and if we're recording this, this is kind of bad. I'm like confessing my ignorance in front of everybody. Uh, not good for business when you're a professor. Finally, Jimenez offers brief accounts of the women arrested in Puerto Rico in part four of the book. These other women were alluded to in other parts of the book so we get a sense of who they were uh, by the time we read their sketches, but we also get a sense that their participation was either limited or not as crucial as the others. That said, the stories of Juana Mills Rosa, Juanita Ojeda, Ramon, Ramona Padilla, Montserrat de Valle, and Angelina Torresola, especially Angelina, are quite compelling. And the book would not have been the same without the presence. I'd like to conclude by stating that national heroines, or nationalist heroines, is a masterpiece. I don't want to say it's all that's masterpiece, because you never know with them. You know, I say that today, and then five years down the road, she comes up with another book, and then I have to say, this one is really, 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 really a masterpiece. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Doctora Olga Jimenez de Wagenheim is professor of emeritus history at Rutgers University, New York, where she thought, where she taught, I thought. She thought too. She thought. <laughs> uh, probably not when you were teaching, though, right? But anyway, for 27 years. She's earned many awards, including the Humanitarian Award in 1998 and the Estremera Latino Leadership Award that we gave her uh, back in 2000. 
2015. She's the author of several books, Puerto Rico, an interpretive um, history from pre-Columbian times to the 1900s, 1998. El Grito de Lares, Sus Causas y Sus Hombres, 1984. And I gotta tell you, this is the book that transformed me, transformed me into a believer of Olga's power. I was an undergrad. My abuelos, when, you know, a professor assigned this book about a Grito de Lares, and you're like, well, what, else, what, else, what else is there to know? And then, of course, uh, Olga <laughs> taught me that there was a lot more to know, and, which is kind of funny because years after that, I'm here, Rutgers Newark, a colleague, uh, Nancy Diaz, introduces me to Olga and says, oh, this is my friend Olga. She doesn't say anything else. And you know, I'm like, yo gusto. ¿Y dónde usted? De Camuy. Un placer. What else is there to say, right? And then I, before I leave, I say, what do you say your last name was? Olga Jimenez de Huala. I just thought you were like her friend or something. Anyway, it's a true story. And finally, quoted it with Kyle, who's here today, the Puerto Ricans, documentary history. Olga, she's my friend, she's my mentor, she's an excellent cook. <laughs> she makes incredible flan, she did not bring any today, but it's incredible, I assure you. So please join me in welcoming Olga.